Inflation has gone up yet again. 7.9% was the latest official reading from the government of the United States. And we'll be talking about how to maintain your standard of living with Britton Hill. He is the president of Weber Global Management. We'll be talking about maintaining your standard of living from both an investment and everyday perspective. Uh, Britton is an expert on commodities analysis, stock picking, and of course, personal finance. Welcome back to the show. Hey, David. Thanks for having me back. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Let's start by talking about investments first. Uh, Weber Global Management is a very diversified fund, and you have money in all sorts of areas. So let's start with the commodity space. Gold, as you know, has hit new, almost new all-time highs. $2,000 has been breached a couple of times in the last week. So how do you feel about the gold space given current levels? It's having a hard time sustaining $2,000, and it's having a hard time moving up beyond previous all-time highs. Is now a good time to get in, or would you wait for a pullback? You know, it's a good question because what we have here, David, are inflation numbers that we haven't seen since the 70s and 80s. And if you look at gold during the 70s and 80s, I mean, it just kept going and going and going. And the common theme among investors was, hey, you know, let's wait for a pullback. And pullbacks very rarely came. Now, from the other standpoint, when you have an asset rise so much in such a short amount of time, you can almost always expect a pullback. But I think the biggest driving factor here is inflation. Um, and I, I think that that 7.9% number that just came out, I think that we're going to see next month's numbers even higher because a lot of that didn't account for the rising gas prices we've seen since this Russia-Ukraine crisis, rising food prices, and other prices across the board. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if we see double digits infl double digit inflation on next month's numbers. So it, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I'm always on the side of, you know, if we're in a bull market and a, a long-term inflationary cycle, go ahead and get your inflation hedges now because, you know, if they pull back a little bit, that's fine. But what if things really just keep going and going and going? I, don't, I think it's only a matter of time before that record high of gold is breached. And I think silver will, will move along with it. Uh, we could see record highs in silver this year as well. Okay. Double digit inflation by next month's reading. Well, one would argue that we're already at double digit inflation if you discount uh, <laughs> the official numbers. We're not talking about right. the official CPI numbers. The most commonly read comments that I see on my videos are uh, in response to my headlines are, hey man, look, 7.9% is just the government reading. My grocery bill's up double digits already. My gas bill's up double digits. Everything's up double digits. Uh, rent is skyrocketing in major cities across the United States. Um, cost of living are going up. And that's the theme of our discussion today. So what is, from an investor standpoint, the best way to hedge against rising inflation? Sure. Uh, you know, commodities are an obvious answer. Um, stocks in moderate inflation are typically good hedges, but I think that we're past the point where stocks would be a good hedge for inflation. So commodities are my go-to. I like gold because gold is stable. It's easy to get in and out of. You can find it everywhere. You can buy it anywhere. Uh, silver is also a good one, but there's also some good commodity ETFs, like broad commodity ETFs that cover the whole spectrum. Um, uh, DBC is a good one. It's an Invesco ETF, and it covers you know gold, wheat, oil, all sorts of things. And so I, I think that might be a good one for, <clears throat> for investors um, to hold in their portfolios. We talked about real estate last time in great detail, you and I. We did an entire episode on real estate. So how do you feel about real estate as an investment hedge? Presumably, if rent is going up, I'm not talking about rent-controlled cities, but just in general, if rent is going up, the underlying property value should be going up as well, no? Uh, yes. Um, typically, you know, it's interesting you bring that up. We, I just had a client. He sold two complexes in the Southeast United States, one for $62 million and one for $58 million to a hedge fund that was all cash. And they purchased that at a 4% cap rate. So the anticipation there when you're buying at a cap rate so low is that you're going to be able to raise rents. But you got to think that eventually there's going to be a time where people aren't going to be able to afford these rents and it's going to, it's going to get too expensive. So I was actually talking about this last night. I could foresee a possible multifamily apartment pullback because I think that there is some risk there with rents rising so fast, too fast for people to keep up with them. I mean, we saw double digit rent growth in most cities in the US last year. And I'm sure it's the same for Canada and other places in the world where rents are just skyrocketing. And I can tell you one thing, people's incomes aren't. It's, it's certainly yeah. not rising at a pace that can keep up with that. Yeah, that's... Uh... 
It's, uh, it's a very serious topic. People are uh, making fun of this, of course, uh, making light of the situation with memes. One meme I saw was, oh, your, your, your wage increased by 7.5%. That's cute. Inflation's at 7.9. <laughs> I right, roll. Right, but, um, yeah, but to your point about rent going up, uh, do you think that the governments will eventually have to step in across the board, across all cities in America, and implement some sort of rent control? Is that the direction we're headed towards? You know, I, I think certainly in more democratic states, that's the direction we're going. Santa Barbara, um, I have a friend that lives in Santa Barbara, and they are doing a whole rent control initiative right now in California, in Santa Barbara, California, where um, originally they only wanted to, they wanted to cap landlords, but they were able to make it at the, the landlord rent increases are capped in inflation plus 2%. So in real terms, landlords in Santa Barbara, California cannot raise rents more than 2%. Uh, at least that's what I last heard. I don't know if there's anything more to that, but mm -hmm. still when your inflation rate is 7.9%, you add 2% on top of that, that's a 9.9% rent increase. So I think that governments are trying to step in, but they're also having to realize like, hey, you know, rent controls are great, but if the inflation rate outpaces, you know, our rent control peak, uh, that's going to cause some serious issues for the landlords. And we yeah. could end up having, you know, a complete loss of housing and, you know, housing that is no longer maintained and, and things like that. So it, it's a really tricky situation. Inflation is particularly nasty with fixed costs and things like that. And, Does and rent control have any impact whatsoever on property value? Let's say I were to buy a condo or a multifamily home for an investment. Would I, would you advise that I stay away from rent controlled areas or does it not matter? Well, I certainly wouldn't want to buy anything with a rent control because the thing is, is there's no real room for speculation and there's no real reward for speculation. You know exactly the amount you're going to be able to increase your rent every single year. Wherein, you know, if I'm speculating on an area and I think, hey, you know, I think this area is poised for growth. There's a lot of really good things happening here. I think property values are going to skyrocket and that's going to make it so I can increase my rents a lot more than, say, you know, 2% per year. Um, I, I, like, I like that concept more than, okay, I know what I'm capped at. And I think that the prices will reflect that. The prices will reflect the capped earning potential, whereas sure. someone that doesn't have rent controls, it's, you know, the world is your oyster. It's as, sure. as good as you can make it, you can earn it. Well, let's go back to stocks. You mentioned that stocks are not necessarily a good inflation hedge. Can you expand on that? Certainly, there, there must be some sectors that do better than others. Energy, for example, oil stocks have done very well. So how do you feel about the stock market overall? Sure, sure. Yeah, I definitely need some clarification there. I think the commodity sector is great and commodity stocks, mining companies, energy companies, things like that, where um, they're still going to be continued to people are going to continue to use their products. And, you know, commodities are skyrocketing and tend to do very well during inflationary cycles. But the thing is, is if you look in the 70s, <clears throat> during the 70s and 80s, the stock markets were very stagnant. I mean, there was a lot of movement with very little direction, just very volatile, up, down, up, down. And I think the reason being is I know that inflation is typically the result of having too much money in the system, but that doesn't necessarily mean that most people have too much money. And so liquid assets are typically the first things to be sold. And inflation hurts the bottom line of, of companies, especially when you have inflation plus supply chain issues, because yeah. not only are costs going up, but we can't get the goods. And by the time we get our goods, it's like, you know, we don't have any margins here now because inflation has risen so much. And so I think that's the biggest thing that happens is business margins just get chewed down to nothing. I know builders, uh, particularly in Utah right now, are starting to feel that burn. For example, our house, we can't get our windows for seven months and our, our builder is sitting mm -hmm. on a construction loan, paying interest every single month on his loan while we wait for our windows to get in. And eventually, you know, these people are, are making these gambles. They're making these, these business, they're taking these business risks only right. to have, you know, massive extensions on everything. And then yeah. by the time they can finally sell their product, again, they have zero margins. And so I think that's the risk for a lot of companies, companies that are reliant on a supply chain that they're not in control of, or that's having issues delivering product. I think that those companies are going to do uh, poorly in this cycle, at least until we can get the inflation under control or until the supply chain catches up so that they can get products out the door quick enough to actually make a decent profit. Okay, so uh, give us some uh, commodities that you think will do well for the remainder of the year. And on that note, maybe give us a few picks of stock sectors that you think will do well. Sure. Um, obviously, let's, we can start with commodities. Gold is a favorite of mine. Uh, silver along with it, but silver's 
kind of a wild animal. I mean, it has massive swings and it, it kind of shoots all over the place. Um, the other thing that is really hard with silver is it's difficult to chart a long history of silver because you look back in the, in the seventies and eighties and you see silver just really popped off. But a lot of that price action had to do with hunt brother manipulation. So we don't really know exactly what the true price of silver was back then. Um, and that's a reference point that a lot of people use when looking at silver. Um, uh, and so, uh, be careful with silver, but gold, I really like, um, one thing that is, is really interesting to me is watching Bitcoin and, the. Uh, the crypto sector, because the argument for them last year was, you know, they've totally replaced gold. They're the new inflation hedge. They're going to perform wildly during inflationary periods. And here we have an inflationary period. Um, and uh, gold has actually been outperforming Bitcoin by a lot. So I, I'm interested to see actually what happens because Bitcoin and the crypto cryptocurrencies, good cryptocurrencies, they do have the inflation hedge properties. And uh, theoretically, you could say, yeah, no, this is an inflation hedge, but they have yet to, I guess, perform to that level. And I'm not saying I don't like cryptos. I do like cryptocurrency, but I, I'm interested to see how they do, if they just need to be ironed out a little bit, but kind of how they perform over the next year. But um, and then stock sectors that I think will do good. Uh, any food companies, mm. obviously, or, or agriculture companies that you can get your hands on, because I think what we're going to see is we're going to see a lot of a lot of things brought uh, local. So rather than importing food and goods and things like that, we're going to bring manufacturing local. I, I know that in my area, they're starting to build plants and things like that to manufacture fertilizers and, and to kind of help with the supply chain issues. And it's finally gotten to a point where things have gotten so expensive that now it is cost effective to build in America again. So, and, and just locally again, in general. So I, I yeah. I'm interested to see how that goes, but food companies, um, you could say maybe some consumer goods, companies like Procter & Gamble that manufacture things that people use every day, uh, you know, toothpaste, napkins, things like that, because mm -hmm. I don't think those are going to go out of style. But um, it's it's a much more difficult time now than it ever has been to pick stocks, at least in my lifetime. Um, I'm a young guy, but anybody that was around back in the 70s and 80s yeah. and investing then kind of had a similar thing. But yeah, I mean... I would be weary of tech that's at a high valuation just because it has a long ways to fall. Uh, but certainly times like these create enormous opportunities. So you don't right. want to be pessimistic forever. Eventually right. you need to flip and turn optimistic and realize, wow, these are some screaming deals, but it's a matter of weighing the economic external factors. And then, you know, the, with the valuations and deciding, okay, I think now is a good time to buy. Things are turning, prices are low. So that's that's really what I'm keeping my eye out for. If I need to just remain in, in something that will sure. at least preserve my wealth during this period so that I can transition it into things that will actually cause my wealth to grow in the next period, I'm all fine doing that. So for now, like, again, gold is a, is a pretty heavy part of my portfolio and has been for the past couple of years. Just one note about gold and we'll move on. Um, how high can gold go in, in this environment? I certainly think we see new record highs. I mean, I don't think 2,500 is unreasonable. I mean, that's only roughly 20 to 25% increase from these levels we're at now. So I could see $2,500 gold. I could even make the argument for $3,000 gold if, if things keep rising how they are, because that's only a 50% increase. And when you consider that gold, or I mean, sorry, oil has gone from negative 40 or $60 a barrel to yeah. $130 a barrel in two years. I mean, See, that was a, that was a trade of the century. I know. I know. I mean, if only we could have bought some oil negative, but there was just nowhere to put it. Um, <laughs> and that was, that was the issue. But uh, yeah, I, I think that gold definitely has some room to run. We, we could see silver run to 50, you know, at least to where it, where it traded at in, in past periods. But I, I, I like to think that a, a range of 2,500 to $3,000 gold is completely reasonable. I think we'll see that in the next year or two. It sounds to me like, given your commodity picks and your stock sector picks, that you're more defensive now than cyclical. So let me ask you this now, Britton, in terms of preserving wealth, given that we have rising inflation or inflation at very high levels compared to before, it's kind of a, it's kind of a juxtaposition. On one hand, you want to have defensive sectors like you mentioned, but on the other hand, you shouldn't have too much cash because that's going to get eroded away by inflation. So what is a good balance here? How much cash would you advise people to hold? Given that, like you said, you might want to have dry powder to take chances when these opportunities do arrive for risk assets to do better, right? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think having a little bit of cash is good, especially during volatile periods, because 
you know, even the best assets can fall during hard times. And the thing is, is you don't want to have to dump a good asset at a super low valuation simply because you need to raise the money to pay a bill. So um, I actually have more cash now than I have in the past. And I know that's kind of a silly thing to say because we have inflation, but I'm doing it to kind of balance the volatility out because in my mind, it's better to lose 7.9% over the year than it is to lose 7.9% over the course of a week by holding a, a, an asset that's doing poorly. So okay, that's um, a good way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I have about 10 to 15% of my portfolio in cash right now at any given time. And as I see good deals, I, I, I buy them. And this, this is a time where I am a little bit more active in trading because I think that there's times where things get out of polarity. You have things that shoot up way too fast. Like we saw oil just shoot up to $130 a barrel and now it's starting to pull back. And similar with the precious metals, I mean, gold just rocketed up to you know, 2050 to 2070, depending on whether you're using futures or spot. Now it's pulling back. Um, and so those are the types of things that, you know, you want to sell high. And then when things get way too low, I mean, we saw the NASDAQ just fall, 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 fall. And anytime you get five, 10, 15 down days or 15 up days in a row, you know that, okay, eventually we're going to see things kind of tilt the other way. And those are the types of things I look for, um, for, to deploy cash when things just get a little bit too far ahead of themselves, or maybe they fall a little bit too far that it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. Um, but definitely keep a healthy amount of cash. Either, and if not to deploy to buy new assets, right. do it for peace of mind and maybe to just cover some bills over the next few months because things are getting expensive and it'll, it'll do wonders for you. How do you feel about fixed income? And that's a very broad topic. I don't just, talk, I'm not, I don't, I don't just mean bonds and coupons. I mean, maybe real estate, like we talked about, rent, uh, maybe stock with a high dividend yield, maybe a stable coin that pays you a yield. Um, this uh, the concept of having a regular passive income during an inflationary period. How do you feel about that? I love passive income um, in any given period. The thing I would watch out for is fixed income instruments that have a face value and that are long term fixed duration. So, like thirty year bonds, I mm -hmm. would not touch those with a ten foot pole right now because. Mm -hmm. You're getting 2% during an 8% inflationary period, eventually those rates are, I mean, they already are moving upwards, but they're going to keep moving upwards. And all that's going to do is it's going to knock your face value down to nothing. We ha I have a, uh, he's, he's going to be a client now, uh, but we just talked, he sold his company for $65 million last year. And he's not a finance guy. He's a businessman. So he didn't know what to do. So naturally he went to one of the big firms and said, Hey, I have all this money. What should I do with it? And they're like, wow, you have more money than you know what to do with. Let's put it into bonds. Bonds are safe. You're never going to lose. And he's like, fantastic. I don't ever want to lose my money. I'm good. So he put the better part of 30 or $40 million in the bonds, yielding about two to 3%. And he called this broker at the beginning of this year and says, all right, where's my tax form? He checked his form and he saw that he actually lost 1%. So these bonds that are never losing, people are actually starting to lose on them. And it was because the face value of his bonds fell over the course of the past year. And so he's actually down one to 2% on his bonds. And I think that we're going to keep seeing things like that, where these people are shocked. They've heard for the past 40 plus years that, you know, bonds are always safe. You're never going to lose. You just keep your yield. Don't get greedy, hold your bonds. And now they're checking their portfolios and they're saying, Oh my God, my bonds are down. What am I going to do? And that, that is concerning to me because I think a lot of people are going to have a nasty wake up call when they check their bond portfolios and see things fall. So Avoid long-term bonds, um, at least until this inflation irons out, or at least until yields get up to the point where they're outpacing inflation, because um, it just doesn't make sense to buy them now. Uh, for right. a shorter term, like the stable coins, uh, I don't, I've never done any stable coin investments, but I, I do know, and from what I understand, you can get in and out of those at any given time, and you're not really at risk of losing face value. So your biggest risk there is, you know, is my stable coin paying enough that I'm outpacing inflation? Um, but, you know... Even if you're just moderately losing to inflation, it's better than having cash in the bank, which is definitely losing to inflation. So stable coins are good. Um, there's also, we've talked about this in the past, you can do short-term hard money loans as long as your collateral is good. Typically, your interest rate is going to be, oh, puppy just hit his head, sorry. Um, as, as long as your interest rate is good. I think your dog disapproves of the uh, low interest rates. I think that's what's going yeah, on. He's telling you, yeah. don't avoid these bonds. That's what your dog is saying. I know the puppy recognizes that this is just an economic catastrophe for bondholders, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think that hard money loans are, are also okay. a good way if you can secure the collateral and your interest rate is good. 
But let me let me ask you about the Ukraine just very quickly. I, I'm not talking about geopolitics here. And you and I are both millennials. We're young people. So you and I actually, well, at least I have never experienced the start of a major armed conflict, at least from an investing perspective. The last time uh, the U.S. invaded Iraq, I was still in high school. So I didn't have any economics or finance background back then, or at least enough knowledge to, to make a call on investing. I was like 13 or 12. Um, so... Right. Uh, you know, what should people do now? I don't want to make it sound like we're war profiteering. That's not what's going on. I'm just asking you about investment shifts and trends that are going to happen uh, or, or change given the winds of war that we're seeing right now. Sure. Um, I think, I mean, certainly this is a, this is a big impact economically, uh, especially to Europe and especially to areas in that are dependent on Russian oil and Ukrainian food exports and things like that. But I think what, what we're seeing here is something deeper. And in the past, when there were conflicts, we often saw a pullback and then a massive rally, but we were in a deflationary environment. Now we have inflation and this, these wars are actually making things a lot worse because they're really starting to cramp the supply chain. So this could actually be something that uh, has a, a, a radically different effect on the economies than what we've seen in the past, especially if we really start to clamp down on our supply chains. Um, I think that, you know, the obvious answer is, okay, we're at war. What, what company should we invest in? Well, there's the defensive stocks and defensive as in like Lockheed Martin, uh, Boeing, Raytheon, the types of companies that, that make, you know, rocket engines, Northrop Grumman, those types of companies. But um, I think the primary driver here is inflation because the NASDAQ started falling off of its highs in November. Well, that was before the Russia-Ukraine conflict was even on the radar. And we fell in November, we fell in December, we fell in January, we fell in February. And the NASDAQ is just constantly making lower lows every time. And then all of a sudden there's this big Russia-Ukraine conflict. And now everybody's saying, well, it's their fault. It's their fault the markets are falling. But I think we might be seeing something similar to what happened in 1973 when everything was being blamed on the oil embargoes. Well, it's the oil embargoes. That's why everything is awful. It couldn't be the fact that we took ourselves off of a gold standard and now we're just printing money and revaluing everything and devaluing our currencies. I think that you know what we could be seeing here is we're, we're painting blame on something that really what we should be painting blame on is the trillions of dollars that we've created in the past couple of years. But to, to answer your question, how should investors be investing? Um, I think that similar to how you just invest for an inflationary period, I think that that's a bigger driver because let's say the Russia-Ukraine conflict ends today. I don't think inflation is going anywhere. I mean, we had inflation last year before this that's was right. even a factor. So uh, commodities, obviously be defensive. I'm not saying sell all your U.S. stocks. I still hold some U.S. stocks, but they're ones that I've held for a long time. I still have gains on. Um, I've lightened up dramatically. I hold more cash and gold now. So I'm just... Mm -hmm. I'm in kind of a holding pattern right now where I just want to wait and see what happens. And I think other people should do that too. I don't think this is Armageddon. Um, and if it is Armageddon, then what does this all even matter anyway? So are you building you know, a bunker, Bill, uh, Britain? Are you, are you, are you, uh, are you, <laughs> I wish. are you investing in bunkers? I can't get any supplies. If I could, I probably would. <laughs> Listen, uh, let's move on to the final segment of our interview today, which is uh, personal finance, especially for the younger folks out there watching. You and I are both millennials. And like I mentioned before, you and I have never experienced a start of the war from an investment perspective. I've never seen 7.9% inflation uh, on, an, uh, on, an, uh, on a government reported basis in my life. And I was born in the 90s. So uh, this is, this is a you know, pivotal point for a lot of people, especially the younger folks who have never experienced this. What should millennials' budgeting priorities be right now? Given inflation, given rising interest rates, given a war that's going on in Eastern Europe, a lot of things going on right now. Oh, don't forget COVID's still lingering. <laughs> yeah, you know, this this sucks. I mean, it, it's <laughs> real picture for, for a lot of millennials. I mean, that's just the, the best way to put it. And even millennials that make a good income, I mean, prices are rising so fast that their good income isn't going to be a good income in a few years. Yeah. And that's the biggest issue. So as, as awful as it sounds, we're not in a great time for people who are just starting out and just trying to, you know, get their feet under them. It, it's tremendously difficult. So my priority here would be, you know, cut back on all the areas you can, you know, don't buy that new car, skip that vacation. Your priority right now should be saving as much as you can, um, aggressively negotiating every contract you sign, whether it's rental contracts or whatever. I mean, you always can negotiate with a landlord um, and there will get to a point where everybody starts negotiating with their landlords. And so the landlords know they need to negotiate. 
Um, That's right. But it, it's challenging. It get, get to your basics. So pay down as much debt as you can. Um, tr- try to save, religiously stick to a budget, at least until you figured out what you need to survive on. And, and I think that's the biggest thing is figuring out where you are, how much you spend and what your needs are at a very basic level. And once you know that, then you can start adding a few things to the mix. Okay. Now that I know I, if I'm making, you know, five or $6,000 a month and after taxes as a professional, and I know that my spend is four grand a month, well, that gives me an extra one to $2,000 a month that, okay, if I need a new car, I can budget that in, or it gives me extra money to save things like that. But definitely it is imperative to figure out what you're spending now and anticipate that that's going to change at least at or the rate of 8% a year. So factor that in. People people have told me uh, in private conversation, I'd just like you to respond to this if you agree or disagree, that because inflation is here, because you know that prices will go up again next year, it's only reasonable to make that assumption, you should buy those big p- ticket items right now. Maybe even take on debt if you need to, because that debt will be eroded away in value by inflation. Do that now. Don't wait till prices go up another 20% next year. Buy that car today. Buy that fridge. Buy that appliance. Buy that vacation now, because next year, a plane ticket's going to go up. Yeah, I mean, if it's a car and you need it for work, absolutely make that purchase now, because like you said, prices are probably just going to get more expensive. Yeah. And um, interest rates are probably going to go up too. So yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely say, okay, do that. Uh, the risky run is, what if the car supply chain incre- or improves and now all of a sudden there's cars back in stock and the prices don't increase or they go down because you know people can finally buy and sell cars. Um, that, that is a risk. Um, buy the vacation. If you're struggling, if you're struggling financially right now, I mean, don't put yourself in a worse position. I just That's had right. to book tickets from Salt Lake City to Charleston, sitting in economy, and they were twelve hundred bucks. I mean, that uh, that used to that's more than what I used to pay for first class tickets. I mean, it's crazy. So, wow. plane tickets are expensive. Um, it's certainly very expensive. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the argument can be made both ways. But I would do responsible purchases now. I, I wouldn't say, you know what. Forget it. The prices are going up anyways. Let's book that trip. All right, to here's, a, here's another. Here's another argument. Okay, let's say I've got a thousand dollars of cash. All right, I can either pay off my. Let's assume I have. I don't know a thousand dollars of credit card uh, bills. Okay, I can either pay off my credit card, or that's that's uh, the interest rate of my credit card. Let's say twenty percent. Let, let's just round number twenty percent. So sure. I'm, you know, that that by for on, on an annualized basis, I could either pay off my credit card or I could use that thousand dollar cash and buy something speculative, speculative like cryptos, which could yield higher than twenty percent. What would you do? <laughs> I'd pay off the credit card debt. Uh, cryptos have not been yielding higher than twenty percent this year, uh, and who knows when that'll change? I do think there will be a year where cryptos yield a lot more than twenty percent, which we've seen in the past. But for now, this is this is the time to be defensive. Uh, I would pay off your debt so you don't have any obligation because what if you take that thousand bucks, you put it into crypto and it gets cut in half. Well, now you only have 500 bucks and your debt is now 1200 bucks by the end of the year because of your 20% interest. So I, I'm always in favor, pay down that high yield debt um, and, you know, make, make another thousand bucks and then invest that into crypto because you'll make your decisions will be a lot less emotionally driven if you're in a good financial uh framework and in, in a good financial position. And that that's really the reason why I hate debt. I mean, I know that debt and leverage can be used to your advantage, but for me personally, when I have a lot of debt, it weighs on me. It bothers me. It, it, it distracts me and it causes me to be more emotional because when I invest, I start thinking about, well, if this goes down and, you know, I have my debt, what am I going to do? And I found that, you know, if I pay down my debt to a level where I know like, okay, I can manage this then the investment decisions I make aren't so much from a survivalist, like I need this to work. It's more from, okay, yeah, if this works, that's great. And I think this will work. And you you make much more sound financial decisions. And they've actually done studies that by paying off your debt to a point where it's manageable, or even completely, if you can, it it actually improves brain function and your ability to delay gratification and, and overall mental health across the board. So I'm always in favor of if you have that debt and you have the choice between paying off a small amount of debt or putting, you know, you're investing your money, I would always say pay off the debt first and then invest because you have a clean slate at that point. Okay. That's understandable. Um, all right. We'll talk about rates and real estate uh, in another interview uh, next time. Um, we've covered enough ground already. Thank you very much. Before I let you go, what about puppies? Should we buy another dog? All else being um, equal. 
already have two dogs. So the other one's right here. Here he is. I mean, yeah, show us your dog. Show us your puppy. What's his name? His name is Blue. He's got two blue eyes. I don't know if you can see him. And then Delta. This oh, is nice. Delta, his big sister. Oh, so cute. two doodles, little Aussie, golden okay. doodle. And I will encourage anybody to get a dog because when all the crazy things <laughs> is going on in the world, at least you have somebody to come home and love you and take care of you. And they're always happy. So love the all babies. right. Well, that's fantastic. I love dogs. Uh, all right. Well, thank you for showing me your dogs and the, the audience uh, and giving us an insight on how to invest in these tumultuous times. Appreciate it. Speak to you next time, Britton. Of course. Take care, David. Thank you very much. Thank you for speaking with us and thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned.